uh, I'm, I was just thinking as a transition to Leibniz, you know, we're, we're talking about China and um, the importance of the, 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 the role of storytelling of, to pass on the ethics and traditions, but you can't obviously like, you know, we, a lot of us have read Schiller. Um, we've read Plato. There's a certain sensitivity that um, I think is being touched upon that you can't just didactically tell somebody how they should behave in order to pass on your your beliefs to the next generation. That doesn't really work. Um, gen, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of examples of kids rebelling from their overbearing parents are attest to that. Um, so to be able to awaken the desires to do the right thing requires a quality of storytelling that is uh, is is almost sacred. And it's a it's a lost art. You know, you get it with Shakespeare. You know, you read a lot of Shakespeare. You see universal lessons garbed on on multiple levels, or Dante, or even Frank Capra. You know, you watch a lot of the Frank Capra movies, even from the nineteen forties and fifties, like Mister Smith Goes to Washington. Uh, and you you you've got this sense that you're 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 receiving a cultural education to become a citizen from being just a low level small local person, yeah. right? To think on a big moral uh, level. And um, Leibniz in his, uh, in his news from China, cause he was, I think one of the, the first and most enthusiastic Western scientists and statesmen who really saw something in the Chinese cultural matrix that he, he recognized as the, the key to solving a lot of the problems that the Western matrix that he was a part of was suffering from. And he even writes, that um, even though the West is more advanced on mathematics and science in his time than the Chinese were, and uh, mechanical engineering and what have you, he said they, the Chinese, based upon his, his conversations with, with missionaries in China and, and readings of Confucius and Mencius, he made the point that, well, they're far more advanced on morals and ethics than we are, and they should even send missionaries to Europe to teach us <laughs> uh, <laughs> ethics. And, uh, and actually how to govern ourselves, um, which is a really funny little intervention he made there. And he saw the Kangxi Emperor kind of like he saw Peter the Great as a potential Solon, as a, as a real uh, philosopher king, um, who was alive at the time that Leibniz w was, was organizing his, uh, his news from China. So Leibniz was a, was a universal thinker, as I think we've all come to gr uh, appreciate more and more over the past several weeks. Um, who not only made discoveries in physical science, in linguistics, in history research, and also in natural law and statecraft, uh, but also in metaphysics, which, I mean, he always, always makes the point in all of his writings that all of these discoveries were branches of metaphysics, um, that there was a higher physics of morality, of ethics, of principle that we could that had all of these different aspects to it in the domains that we, we can label and categorize you know, in chemistry or math or whatever, but, but it, it, it was a very interesting approach that he had and it, it bore a lot of fruit. So last week we began looking at, uh, if I recall, not began, but we continued our investigation in the uh, discourses on metaphysics, looking at the geometry of thought. How does thought move like Quan just went through uh, just now from taking us through a space where our understanding is of a first degree nature, a second degree, third degree, fourth degree nature to the point that we can move from living in the world of believing in our senses and just making judgments based upon sensory impressions to becoming analytical thinkers, right? And realizing that there's no higher rules of thought to becoming to even a higher level where we can recognize that there is a certain creative relationship to discoveries of formulas that shape sets that change in time as we make new discoveries to the higher order still, where we discover that there's something of a common characteristic among, among every possible discovery that we could make in every branch that allows us playfulness and intuition, this intuitive knowledge. I forget the word he uses, but I think we'll, we'll review it. Um, and how does that, how does our identity change in accordance with whatever stage that we've reached and thus our responsibilities. And Leibniz also makes the point that there's a relationship between um, understanding and power. 
and that the more you have an understanding of something, the more you, your power to change things also increases reciprocally. And a just society um, would, kind of like we're getting at with this idea of a proper meritocracy, would become would respond to and and allow somebody to rise in their own influence politically, at, you know, in society according to their level of knowledge and power to do things well. So that's something that Leibniz discusses in a lot of his writings. He touches upon it in the discourses on metaphysics. Um, today, I'd like us to, to start by, and I'll do a little, hey, Cynthia and Kevin. We have Cynthia and Kevin right there. All right. I think also. Oh, hey. Okay. All right, so I'm going to do a little screen share. Um, let me find the, yes. yeah, OK. All right, so we're going to backtrack. Uh, to number 26, which I think is just so beautiful. We read 26 last week. That's what we ended on. I'd like us to reread that because, again, it's just so great. We're now, Leibniz is beginning to now really, really flesh out his understanding and love for Plato, Plato's Phaedo that we discussed, mm -hmm. that Leibniz himself actually translated Plato's Phaedo. Um, and he'll compare that with um, anti-Platonists, namely Aristotle, soon. So let's read number 26. Uh, who wants to read the first... 26 and 27, maybe 28. Um, Bob, you want to you start? 26? 26. Okay, I got something on my screen. Oh, that, okay. Uh, to get a good grip on what ideas are, be warned of an ambiguity. Some people take an idea to a form or a differentiate a differentia of our thought, so that we have the idea in our mind only when we are thinking of it. Oops, okay. And when, <clears throat> when it, my screen was blinking. And whenever we think of it, again, we have different but similar ideas of the same thing. Others, however, seem to take an idea to the immediate object of a thought. I'm sorry. Hold on. I'm so sorry. I'm. 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 I'm I think it's my fault here because I'm. Yeah. Yeah. It bigger for the, you, so you can read it. The print just keeps changing. <laughs> yeah, that's my fault. Sorry. Okay. Okay. I was on. Or to be some kind of permanent form which continues to exist even when we are not contemplating it. I side with the latter group. And here's why. Our soul always possesses the ability to represent to itself any nature or form when the occasion for thinking of it arises. This ability is permanent, even though the individual thoughts in which it is exercised come and go. And I believe that this ability of our soul, when it expresses some nature, form or essence is properly called an idea of the thing. And it is in us, always in us, whether or not we're thinking of the thing. For our soul always expresses God and the universe and all essences as well as all existences. That requires our soul to have ideas of all those things at all times, which it can do only if ideas are abilities rather than individual mental or events or aspects or properties of such events. This fits in with my principles for nothing naturally enters our mind from outside. And it is a bad habit of ours to think of our soul as receiving messenger species or as if it had doors and windows. We have all these forms in our mind and indeed always have had because the mind always expresses all its future thoughts and is already thinking confusedly of everything it will ever think clearly. We couldn't be caught, we couldn't be taught something unless we already had the idea of it in our mind. The idea being like the matter out of which the thought is formed. Plato understood this very well. 
when he put forward his doctrine of reminiscence. The latter, the latter, uh, oh, well, okay, is very sound, provided we have it in the right way, cleansing it of the era about pre existence and not imagining that if a soul takes in and thinks about something now, it must at some time, at some earlier time, have clearly known and thought about it. He also confirmed his opinion by a beautiful experiment. He introduces a small boy whom he gradually leads to an acceptance of very difficult geometrical truths about incommensurables without teaching him anything, only asking him an orderly sequence of suitable questions. This shows that our souls have virtual knowledge of all these things that to grasp truths, they need only to have their attention drawn to them. And thus that our souls at least have the ideas on which those truths depend. They might even be said to possess these truths if we consider the truths as relations between ideas. Should I continue? Yeah, just keep, keep quick thought. And any, for anybody watching on YouTube, um, he just referred to the doctrine of reminiscence. And last week, in last week's reading, we discussed the example of the Mino dialogue where Plato takes the young slave boy of Mino, the slave owner, and takes him through a series of questions where the young boy is able to discover uh, how to double the square. And I'm, did anybody have a chance to do that this week? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. All right. <laughs> so before we meet up next week, uh, try to do it. Draw it out on paper and take a picture and send it to me or something and let me know how you guys are thinking about it. And next week... What's odd is that I came across something online that talked about doubling the cube. And I, I did, you know... And it reminded me of your, you know, <laughs> you asking us to double the square, but, you know, it was not something that I was going to spend too much time on. My, uh, my, it, it the, just, cube, the cube is next level stuff. I've, I've spent years yeah. thinking about doubling the cube, and uh, I still can't say that I understand it. Uh, <laughs> but the square is doable. It's eminently accessible. So, so everyone try it out throughout the course of the next seven days. So yeah, let's, let's from there go to number 27 for sure. We've talked about Plato. Let's look at something else. Okay. 27. Uh, Aristotle preferred to compare our souls to as yet blank tablets that could be written on. And he held that there is nothing in our understanding that doesn't come from the senses. This squares better with everyday notions, as Aristotle usually does, unlike Plato, who goes deeper. Ordinary usage does sanction these doctrines or rules of thumb in the spirit in which people who follow Copernicus still say that the sun rises and sets. Indeed, I often find that we can find, we can give them a good sense in which they are not merely passable or excusable, but entirely true. In the way in which, as I have already remarked in section 15, it can truly be said that particular substances act on each other and that we receive knowledge from outside by the agency of senses because some external things contain or express more particularly the reasons why our soul has certain thoughts. But when we are pursuing precise metaphysical truths, it is important to recognize how much our soul contains and how independent it is of other things. These, <coughs> excuse me, these, its extent, and its independence go infinitely, I'm, I can't see the top. Oh, sorry. 
infinitely further than the plain folk imagine. Although in ordinary talk, we attribute to the soul only what we are most plainly aware of, only what belongs to us in one manner, because there is no point going any further. Still, it would be good to choose specific terms for each way of talking, so as to avoid ambiguity. So those expressions that are in our soul, whether conceived or not, can be called ideas. But those that are conceived or formed in a consciously self-aware manner <coughs> excuse me, uh, can be called notions or concepts. But in whatever way we take the term notion, it is always false to say that all our notions come from so-called external senses. For my notion of myself and of my thoughts and therefore of being, substance, action, identity, and many others come from an internal experience. Well, do you want me to continue? Uh, well, let's switch around. Let's do like two uh, two sections sections each. Um, any well, first of all, any any thoughts quickly before we go on to twenty eight? I think that was pretty pretty straightforward. But if there's any any questions well, that uh, people have? Uh, pretty straightforward, true, but at the center of uh, all philosophy. Go on. What was that? At, at the center of all philosophy. Wow. You know, the blank tablet uh, theory mm. versus uh, the seeds that mm. we have to nurture in order to bring forth what is within. I think that uh, if I still use that, bar that image or that metaphor of the battle, that's the battle of the mind for universal history. Yes. Absolutely. And I love that he contrasted this little section on Aristotle and how uh, Aristotle believes if, you know, ultimately in the blank slate theory. And he contrasted that to what he said before in 26 on Plato and his preference by far for Plato's approach to the immortality or the quality of the soul as containing all ideas already as the material that out of which thoughts are formed uh, that are pre-existent. Um, but his choice to contrast the two means he is zeroed in on the the crux of history, right? Like the crust of, mo of modern history is shaped by the the uh, schism of the thing that we're told today in our world, there is no schism. That Aristotle was somebody who's a student of Plato and he just advanced on Plato, had his own views, but we're not at, there's a lot of work to smooth out, to iron out the the opposing qualities of paradigms contained in both of these authors that Leibniz doesn't miss at all. Um, that's really very yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm getting yeah, I, from... Yeah, yeah. Uh, please go ahead, Bob. Please go ahead. Oh, well, what I was getting from that was that uh, according to the Platonic theory, uh, the truth is outside for, for uh, people to sort of... Uh, it, it's independent of the self, in other words. Uh, we imagine it, we try to, uh, we try to uh, the, develop our, our concepts around it, I guess, but, but there, there are some things that are more individual and personal that have nothing to do with the truth, but I don't know, we, we may be talking in terms of validity validity of those things. Uh, I, I just, I guess that, um, you know, hard to, for me to uh, grasp, but I think it in terms what it, what, of what he's saying is uh, the truth is, is out there. It's independent of the, the person. No, and that the person, not really. he, he didn't person is he, accessing it. No, no. I, I mean, he, what is he saying? He's saying that there's well, no dichotomy between the truth that exists in the universe and the, and the truth that exists inside of us there. It's, it's connected so that um, all, uh, all that is possibly discoverable or ponderable forever 
is already contained inside of our soul. Yes, oh, Matthew. Uh, no. Matthew, I, yeah. uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay, but I think here it's a, it's a, according to me. Yeah, uh, there is a very big important thing here. Okay? okay, and and that's why the oligarch succeed to a certain extent to mesmerize people. Okay. Okay. And I would like to go back to the allegory of the cave, okay? Because as long as you have your neck chained to the wall and you can only see the shadows, uh, the Aristotelian uh, arguments can seems to be very compelling, okay? <clears throat> and and the, the, uh, the, the struggle or the, the advancements of the mind precisely is to break through that ceiling of uh, the lower level of beauty to go to the higher level of beauty, okay? Because once again, uh, for people living in the first three levels of the shadows uh, of uh, blind guesses and of uh, uh, conventional truth, the maximum they can get to is mathematical formula, okay? That's why people who are capable to give mathematical formula are perceived as God-like figures inside that box, okay? And the difficulty precisely is to use art, the music, literature to break that ceiling of the lower part of beauty, mathematical formulas, and the upper part of beauty is uh, art, literature, philosophy, in order to go to goodness and truth. And once again, if, you're, if, if the educational program is not capable to give uh, value tools to break that ceiling, uh, it's very easy for the oligarch to mesmerize people, especially that they wouldn't do special things like making people believe that uh, Bertrand Russell is a specialist of Leibniz, for example, what you said, Matthew, okay? Because all their aim is to make people believe that Aristotle is another way to express Plato and that there's no difference. And then when you get to the lower part of beauty is, is, the, is the maximum that we can reach to as a human being, okay? And, and, and that's the the nexus of our conversation, according to my understanding. No, that, that's good. Yeah, that's exactly it. Trying uh, to understand Aristotle, uh, Plato from the standpoint of Aristotle is like trying to understand Leibniz from the standpoint of Bertrand Russell. And uh, it's not going to work. It's not going to, yeah. Now, aren't we talking about two kinds of truth here? This, this truth is as... Uh, Scientific truth, uh, whether something is uh, has certain qualities in nature or whatever, and then there's the truth as, let's say, uh, for, for lack of a better, uh, a better uh, idea, the, the, the truth involved in, in whether a certain sequence of events were true as presented by, for instance, uh, the press in yeah. a, a journalistic account of what happened. Yeah, he's going to elaborate this in number 28, exactly this, but you're right. There, there's one set of truths that are defined by, like Aristotle says, it's the senses. All of our understanding comes from the senses. Okay. And thus... That idea of truth, he's, he says it's like people saying this, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. You know, he's like, it's a practical truth. It's a, it's a poor man's truth that's, um, that lets you get around things okay, but it isn't the type of truth you can only access through the mind's eye when you learn to see with reason, um, right, with beyond the senses. That's a, high, a higher quality of truth that you can't get at through that lower domain. And yeah, if you just read the mainstream media, they appeal to that lower domain quite a bit, um, mixed with some embellishment. Now, in, the, in section 28, he's going to get right into the metaphysical truths of God. 
right. um, and, and causality, which he's been developing in sections 14, 15, 16. And now he's sort of like wrapping up a lot of these ideas that have like been gestating and gestating. So let's see where, how he treats that. Now for number 28, who wants to read uh, the next couple? Not all. Yeah. yeah, I can do that. All right. Okay, everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. okay, good. Now, in strict metaphysical truth, God is the only external cause that acts on us. And he alone affects us directly in virtue of our continual dependence. Therefore, no other external object touches our soul and directly triggers our perception. So it is the continual action of God upon us that enables us to have in our souls ideas of all things. Here is how that happens. All effects express their causes. And so the essence in brackets, intrinsic nature. The essence of our soul is a particular expression, imitation, or likeness of God's essence, thought, and will, and of all the ideas contained in it. So we can say that God alone is our immediate external object, and that we see all things through him. When we see the sun and the stars, for example, it is God who gave us the relevant ideas and who conserves them in us and who, by his ordinary concurrence, following the laws he has established, brings it about that we actually think of them when our senses are suitably disposed. God is the sun and the light of souls, the light which lighteth every man that cometh into this world. And this is not a new opinion. In addition to Holy Scripture and the fathers, who have always been more. Oh, sorry. You got to scroll it down. Right. Who have always been more Plato than for Aristotle. I remember having sometimes noticed that many people in the time of the scholastics held that God is the light of the soul, or as they used to say, the active intellect of the rational soul. The Averroes twisted this the wrong way, but others have taken it in a manner worthy of God and capable of raising the soul to knowledge of its true good. Okay. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. Any, uh, <laughs> do we go on? Yeah. I, I just want to point out that, so when they say there's something um, to uh, to look at here, because they're not saying, uh, so it's not, uh, it's not saying, it's saying that it's the active intellect of the, of the rational soul. So, the word active is very interesting over here because it's talking about the it's not talking about intellect as is but it's talking about the transformational uh, quality um so it's at the end of uh, page 28 yes yes uh, absolutely you're right brian because that is precisely the connection what i when i talked with matthew uh, two minutes or five minutes ago when i said it's the nexus of the problem the active intellect is the intellect activated by the upper ideas and not only by the, it's uh, top down and not bottom up. Okay, there is a part that is bottom up and you can make your life with the bottom up process. Okay, but you better try to get what is from the top so that the top would activate your lower intellect. Yeah, because the thing is that I think there's a difference between um, intellect sheds light on something and gives understanding, right? Um, yes. You yes. pierce. Inter 
you, you pierce into an intellect. object. Yeah, you pierce into an object and you understand it, but it doesn't necessarily uh, allow for tra the, the transformational quality. So transformation is another is another thing. So when they oh, yeah. say over here, yeah. So when they say over here is, uh, they are, as they used to say, the active intellect. So, um, active, yeah, active intellect is that essence or that thing that is able to change the the nature or the quality of one ingredient. You see, um, so yeah, I, I think it's a, it's just an important uh, it's an important highlight to to look at. I find. Yeah. Yes, because the intellect is the machine that has been given to you with a, with a human body. Okay, as w with a human body, you got an, uh, a pair of eyes, you got a pair of ears, and so on. The intellect is only the organ organizing principle through articulate language. Okay, but it's the, if that intellect is not activated by the forms of beauty, goodness, and truth. Uh, it's not an active intellect, or I prefer to say an intellect activated by higher forms. Yeah. And it's continuing. Yeah, well I, I think that's also important that he's making the point that it's the active intellect of the rational soul um, that, that, you know, because uh, you could also have the, the active, and he, he was talking earlier in previous sections about passive and active uh, intellectual experiences, right? The passive receiving versus the active um, acting upon and how, so he, he's, he's playing with these two ideas, but you could, you could also have, I think, the active intellect of an irrational soul as well that doesn't manifest God's will and thoughts, but does the opposite since we have free will and we have evil, like he said at the beginning. So, you know, you, you have... Yeah, the, the idea of an active intellect being contingent upon a rational soul to be a conduit or an expression of God's light um, is important because it's not like just by being active intellect, you're thus doing the right thing. Well, that's uh, the intellect alone is pistis, okay, uh, conventional truth okay so once again i go back to the image of uh, uh, the, the the allegory of the cave okay because the allegory of the cave is the perfect picture for the different levels of the mind okay at the same time those different levels of the mind will create different kind of human beings and those different kinds of human beings will create different kind of societies and here we come back again to universal history Okay, and uh, if you are not capable to liberate yourself or with the help of some people who have liberated themselves, uh, you will not be capable to go beyond that intellect not activated by the higher forms of beauty, goodness, and truth. That wise for the plutocrats, justice is only the appearance of justice and not something to be truly accomplished. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's why, uh, to rem I remember what you said uh, in, uh, last week uh, or two weeks ago, uh, people would say that Plato and uh, those uh, extraordinary thinkers were just uh, why hypocrite males, for example, okay? Because if your intellect is not activated by beauty, goodness, and truth, uh, those things uh, would be perceived li like... Uh, hypocritical uh, maneuver to manipulate people and not something true that everyone can uh, go to mm. if they give the if they make the necessary effort obviously mm -hmm. yeah cool I just see somebody put something in a chat oh that was me that was privately to you <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> Uh, all right, I'll look at that later. Okay, so um, let's go to 29. And uh, yeah, Jerry, it's a small one. So you can do 29 and 30, Jerry. Okay, all right, 29. However, I don't share the opinion of some able philosophers, most notably Malbranch, 
who seem to maintain that our ideas themselves are in God and not at all in us. In my view, this comes from their having partly grasped, but not yet thought through the points I have just been making about substances and about the whole extent and independence of our soul. Points which imply that the soul contains everything that happens to it and expresses God and with him all possible and actual beings as an effect expresses its cause. Anyway, it is inconceivable that I should think with someone else's ideas. <laughs> Furthermore, when the soul thinks of something, it must actually come to be in a certain state. And it must have contained in advance not only a completely determinate passive power of coming to be in that state, but also an active power in virtue of which its nature has always contained signs of the future production of this thought and dispositions to produce it when the time comes. And all this, the passive power, the active power that includes the forward looking signs and the disposition have wrapped up in it the idea involved in the thought. I was just thinking quickly when when people actually do start uh, doubling the uh, the area of the square, you're going to start having thoughts about the problem, right? Which you don't know the answer to if you haven't done it yet. And just be aware, like I'm, I would just advise to really think carefully about what your mind is doing at each step of the way as you're making mistakes, trying something new. And all the way to the point that you, you figure out the Eureka, you get it? And think back on what you just did and the process that happened when that square doubled in surface area, still becoming a square. And as, as, as Leibniz says, you know, this is actually something of an investigation of transcendentals um, or incommensurables, as some say. Um, think about that because it, it's something which is true no matter what, even if you didn't have that thought, it would still be true. And millions of people have probably been through that experience and came to that idea, but it's still your own. It's still individually your own, even though it's still true and always will be true, even a million, 25 billion years in the future. <laughs> um, on When students are in Alpha Centauri <laughs> doing geometry, uh, they're going to come to that same thought and it'll still be theirs, but it'll always be true. So that, just think about that uh, when you're making your ge geometrical exercise this week. Okay, number 30. Yep. As regards God's action on the human will, there are a number of quite difficult itch issues that it would be tedious to pursue here. Here in outline is what we can say. In his ordinary concourse with our actions, God merely follows the laws he has established. That is to say, he continually preserves and produces our being in such a way that our thoughts occur spontaneously and freely in the order laid down by the notion of our individual substance, in which they could be foreseen from all eternity. Furthermore, he determines our will to choose what appears to us the best, yet without necessitating it. He does this by decreeing that our will shall always tend towards the apparent good thus expressing or imitating the will of God to the extent that this apparent good has, as it always does here, some real good in it. I comment now on, quote, without necessitating it, unquote. Absolutely speaking, our will is in a state of indifference as opposed to necessity. 
It has the power to do otherwise or to suspend its action altogether, each alternative being and remaining possible. It is therefore up to the soul to take precautions against being caught off its guard by events that come into its ken. And the way to do this is to resolve firmly to be reflective and in certain situations not to act or judge without mature and thorough deliberation. It is true, however, and indeed it was settled from all eternity that a particular soul will not employ this power to pause, reflect, deliberate on some particular occasion. But whose fault is that? Does the soul have anyone to complain of except itself? Any complaint after the fact is unfair if it would have been unfair before. But would it have been decent for this soul just before sinning to complain against God as if he were determining it to sin? What God determines in these matters cannot be foreseen. So how could a soul know that it was determined to sin unless it was already doing so? It is simply a matter of not choosing to. And God couldn't have set an easier or fairer condition than that. And accordingly, judges do not look for the reasons that led a man to have an evil intent, but concern themselves only with how evil it is. But perhaps it is certain from all eternity that I shall sin. Answer that yourself, perhaps not. And instead of dreaming on about what you can't know and okay, what you can't know and can't learn from, act according to your duty, which you do know. But how does it happen that this man will certainly sin? The reply is easy. It is that otherwise it wouldn't be this man. For God sees from all time that there will be a certain Judas whose notion or idea which God has contains that future free action. That leaves only the question of why such a Judas, a traitor, who in God's idea is merely possible, actually exists. But no reply to that question is to be expected here on this earth, except that in general we should say, since God found it good that Judas should exist, despite the sin that he foresaw, this evil must be repaid with interest somewhere in the universe. God will extract some greater good from it. And the bottom line is that this course of events the actual one that includes the existence of this sinner, will turn out to be the most perfect of all possible ways things could have gone. But while we are journeying, journeying through this world, we can't always explain the admirable economy of that choice. We must settle for knowing it without understanding it. And at this point, it is time to acknowledge the richness and unfathomable depth of the divine wisdom and not to look for a detailed account of it, an account that would be infinitely complex. It is quite clear, though, that God is not the cause of evil. Man's soul, man's soul been possessed by original sin ever since he lost his innocence. But that was not the start of it. Even before that, all created things, just because they were created, were intrinsically limited or imperfect in a way that makes them capable of sin and of error. 
St. Augustine and others have held that the root of evil lies in nothingness. And I think that this should be taken as saying what I have just said, namely that evil comes from the lacks and limits. I can't see that bottom line there. Oh, sorry. You can scroll down just a bit. Yes, sir. There. Namely, that evil comes from the lacks and limits of created things, which God graciously remedies by the degree of perfection that he is pleased to give. This grace of God in both its ordinary and its extraordinary versions varies in how deep and wide it goes. But it is always enough not only to save a man from sin, but also to secure his salvation, as long as he uses his own resources to combine himself with that grace. It is not always sufficient to overcome a man's inclinations. If it were, his inclinations would have no effect on anything, and he would no longer be responsible for anything. That kind of sufficiency belongs only to absolutely effective grace, which is always victorious, whether through itself or through the combination of circumstances. It's a, it's a mighty passage. It's a very mighty passage, yes. Yeah. I just want to make a comment because I was confused and I had to do some research to find out what grace was and according to Augustine man's love for God is agape but God's love for man is grace so God has grace man does man has agape he seems to be saying that there's some things that are predetermined there and I don't know what passage but Let's see. Says God found it good that Judas should exist despite the sin that he foresaw. This evil must be repaid with interest somewhere in the universe. God will extract some good from it. And the bottom line is that this course of events, the actual one that includes the existence of the sinner, will turn out to be the most perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, it well, it's like you know what he seems to be saying there is that God, you know, Satan is there, but it's predetermined. It's it's okay. Everything's going to be all right, and God's going to it's going to turn out good in the end. Have you ever listened to the uh, the speech by Martin Luther King Jr. on uh, good and evil, where he uses the famous arc of the the arc of the universe? bends towards justice. Have you ever heard that speech? Uh, I, I've heard he had, I probably have because I, I, I've i read his speeches and uh, yeah, I mean, he's eloquent, you know, and this is a little bit, you know, more archaic. So we're trying to, I'm trying to get, you know, where he's coming from in terms of uh, predestination, which he seems, some of it seems to be, you know, the good and the evil, which, uh, it, I mean, he seems to be suggesting here that God has let safe, you know, it's like, uh, well, Bob, let, let, letting a, a, a uh, a beast out of the cage, you know. With 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 this um, paper, I think the thing to to hold in mind is that each section there's thirty five or thirty six sections. Each one is is built upon ideas. Each one's like its own self contained idea, but is building upon each other to a higher unified sort of idea. Um, okay. Yeah. Right. One one of the things he he's been getting at in earlier sections, if you recall, is the idea that essences determine like all 
possibilities are contained in the essence of things. So like he gives the example of Alexander the Great, right? Did he cross in the Rubicon? Um, did he have to cross the Rubicon to the degree that he was the identity of Alexander the Great with all of the, the experiences and attributes that shape that identity as an essence? Means, he did. You mean Caesar? Uh, sorry, Caesar. Yeah, did I see Alexander? Yeah, sorry about that. Caesar, yes. To the degree that Julius Caesar was Caesar, yes, he did. Um, but with free will, the question also becomes, how does an essence change itself, which, which other essences that are not human can't do? So that's also something floating that he's been weaving into his discourse throughout the thing too, right? Because um, he's, he's ultimately wanting to change people by, and he's changed himself um, in the course of his discoveries. So <clears throat> he's giving us an infrastructure to just sort of think about certain concepts that allow us a greater power of changing ourselves and then changing the universe. So to the degree that we don't make those discoveries, we have a certain uh, predestination for things we can do which will be limited, maybe even, maybe even destructive without the knowledge that we could otherwise have gained and changed our, our identities. So I think that that's, I don't wanna, I, I, I would just warn against trying to read this in a fatalistic way, because yeah, all but, the evidence we've got so far. Yeah, so, uh, well, I, no, I mean, I understand overall, yeah. you know, we're, we're talking about something, you know, the, the essence of it was ahead of its time. You know, it, it, it's just that the, there are some things in there that, that are also archaic. And uh, the, the essence that, I, that I fi I'm finding is that, uh, you know, the, the belief in uh, a concept of God and, uh, and uh, in a moral purpose in human beings uh, you know, and they're in communicating with a, a certain truth. Uh, and I, I just think we're getting, you know, some of some of some of some of this is is uh, you know repetitive, you know, and uh, it can be a little bit confusing uh, in in the sense of. Uh, his intent, even you know, for uh, uh, we have to remember these. He was writing in the what the 18th century. Yeah, we're talking about that. Uh, I think he's thought through. He knows the terms he's using. But I, I Quan, I, I saw you. You had a thought. Did you want to? Uh... Yeah, because I want to back what just Jerry said uh, ten minutes ago. Okay, that we have agape, but God have has grace. Okay. And uh, the other word that you said, predestination, okay? Uh, I think that predestination is a thing if you are not capable to get higher energy source, okay? The only way that we can get higher energy source is to be in, in harmony and truly in the musical sense of the word, okay? Uh, when you are in harmony of someone or with some thing, uh, you are on the same vibrational level, okay? So agape for man is the deep joy related to discovery and creativity. And for God, that deep joy is grace, okay? So we, as human beings, we get into the same vibrational uh, modulation when we are on the pathway of discovery and of uh, creativity, okay, at the level of goodness, okay, it used the 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 name of the idea corresponding to agape. Uh, uh, once again, I'm sorry to always put my cassette. That's the nexus of a true education, because the education, the the, the brainwashing given by the oligarchs, you can go quite high, okay, to the lower level of beauty. But you have to break that ceiling to go on the other side. And in the, uh, the uh, allegory of the cave, it's precisely the moment when you remove the color, okay? Because if you remember the image, okay? The people are attached and they, they are hold to a, by a color and, uh, and you are a prisoner as long 
as you don't break uh, that ceiling to go to the other side of beauty. And that's precisely the role of philosophy, literature, and art. And, uh, and, uh, and what did the oligarch destroy during the last century? Classical beauty, okay? Because that's the key to go to the upper of the idea of beauty. And uh, the concept of uh, determinism or predestination, I think it's valuable because it's applied to everyone who did not open that second floor of beauty. Because in order to escape uh, uh, determinism or predestination, you need a higher source of power. And that higher source of power is precisely when you are in the same mode of vibration than God by his grace when he's creating and when we are creating. So we have the same emotion, not at the same level, of course, but we have the same vibrational modulation. When a human is at agape, he would be capable to understand the joy of God's grace. And I think that uh, that thing from St. Augustine that Jerry just uh, said uh, 15 minutes ago is quite interesting and uh, goes with my cassette. That's why I jump on it. We, we might want to read St. Augustine's on the free choice of the will, even on the nature of good and evil, God. Um, yeah, that, that it's a platonic dialogue that Augustine wrote. Um, and it flows really well between what both you just now and Jerry had, had developed on. Hmm. Yeah, because if we don't reach to that level of power, okay, because we, we are reading Leibniz, so I use his vocabulary, uh, powers and essence, okay? He used powers for the lower th powers, but when you get to the vibrational mode, the modulation of essence, it's from there that you create and it's from there that you escape from predestination precisely, okay? Mm -hmm. Because once again, the seeds contain everything that a person would manifest. Mm -hmm. But th that manifestation, will it be simply the results of the pressure of his companions, of circumstances, of history, what we call fate? Okay, and even powerful people like the ancient Romans believe in fate because they were perfectly aware that most humans were defined by fate. But some were capable to escape fate because they were capable to go higher or, or deeper. Okay, I prefer deeper because higher has a little bit of a judgmental connotation. So I prefer to say deeper. Well said. Uh, yeah, which, like which in the case of like classical art, like Shakespeare's tragedies or Schiller's tragedies, the whole idea is how do we break people free from their fate to become more than our, our fate? Because if we, if we remain part of the mob or we, we remain in a, in a lower state um, that we were conditioned to be a part of in a controlled environment that we were born into, and that's what Schiller's talking about in his aesthetical letters, right? Um, that some of us have, have recently read is uh, all of our, our ensuing actions and decisions in life will be bounded by our ignorance and by our impulses that we haven't learned to think about or, or harness and domesticate within ourselves. So we'll always be slaves to a higher will. Um, but if we, if we can break free of that, and that's the, purpose of great tragedy if it's done well is to help people become self-aware of their own tragic impulses so that they will move away and beyond them and then be really attain attaining a free will and most people don't you can't really say they have free will if they're all just inclined to think that their identities are based on their ability to be popular and adapt to a mob and its tastes which are all controlled anyway by who controls the taste of the mob in a popular you know, in popular opinion and all these things. So it's a, 
Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Why, like you said, Quan, classical arts have been so undermined in all parts of the world, wherever there is the presence of empire, because they, they want to break us away from our ability to access that, that thing that Schiller talks about. Yeah, because that's the key to the second floor of beauty. Mm. And when you get to the second floor of beauty, uh, you're beginning to escape fate. Mm. All that is true. Uh, but uh, the thing here with, uh, with Leibniz, this particular uh, reading that I'm finding, I think, is, is uh, I think, just thinking about what uh, the lecture on Leib on uh, uh, Schiller, for example, and just the history of Leibniz, where he applies uh, to his, for for instance, he was with the uh, Queen Anne, I guess, corresponded with, and Princess Sophie, and and you know the that whole historical account. Uh, I'm just wondering whether we would learn more in the application of his philosophy than this is is just kind of going in the same place, I think. You know? uh, and uh, all those things that Quan said, are, I, I find valid. And you know, it, it's just uh, that I'm wondering whether you know, he's extracting things from it that are, are are really good points, but probably that's where we should be going because uh, the uh, Bob, the, what? Just to intervene quickly because I'm I'm trying to understand your. So you were talking about uh, liveness, and you you mentioned Queen Anne. Um, I'm just trying to look at the the relationship between like what, what to, well. You know, Okay, in my mind, well, just from other lectures that I'd been reading, uh, Leibniz was a historical thing. He was very active politically as well as, as uh, was brought out in other le uh, lectures. And I find that particularly fascinating because uh, that's where the whole, all the Venetians came up from, uh, and uh, infiltrated first in Holland and then in, uh, in England. And that was uh, under Queen Anne. And she was poisoned. And with, where Leibniz was, was the, uh, in Hanover, uh, the Countess was poisoned. And what was left, the Countess's son was George the first, and he went over to uh, England and became king. Mm -hmm. And the, the Venetians, that's what I'm understanding, this whole, uh, uh, the Venetian infil infiltration came at that time. And uh, historically, I just find that that, that, uh, that are very significant, very important. I'm, I'm wondering the, with with this whether we've been on this too long and not gone into the nitty gritty of the politics that 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 it is uh, has influenced. For anybody listening on YouTube, am I making uh, sense? For anybody listening on YouTube, uh, it would be useful to go to the link in the description box. Uh, to Venice versus Leibniz, which was a previous reading series based on an article um, that goes through some of what Bob just went through. Um, Bob, I would I would just throw out there. Yeah, I, I kind of get where you're coming from, Bob. I I just don't think like Leibniz pointed out in a uh, previous. Um, it's so sorry, I've got an echo. It's distracting. Um, Leibniz had uh, pointed out in a previous section that. There are these two layers of, of knowledge. And uh, when we have practical knowledge and true knowledge, like metaphysical knowledge, where we see with the mind's eye, which is tied to grace and love, like agopic love, which is very different from the practical 
sort of knowledge where people say, you know, the sun rises in the, in the West, uh, East set, or rises in the, I'm, I'm confusing it now where the sun rises and sets. It's not the case. The sun is not rising and setting. It's not moving. We're the ones moving, but it's practical wisdom. Um, that that's, that's not the, the thing he cares so much about. That's like lower order. And so Leibniz's the practical, uh, designs Leibniz created in his life politically, I don't think are the, where we'd want to find the true source and essence of his mind, his mind. No, I, I, I'm sorry. I, maybe I went off on a tangent, uh, Matthew, uh, you know, continue, but I'm, I'm just saying I enjoy the, the exchange, uh, Kwan's remarks and all, you know, that, but we're, we're talking, we're interpreting him then, you know, and uh, then when we get into the, the actual reading, uh, we, we're going into a metaphysical world, and I, I, I think it's good that it is interpreted, uh, but it's, it's difficult because of the archaic language. That's all. Okay. Yeah, don't. Sure, yeah. Please, please continue okay. with that. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, we'll but uh, you know, Bob, uh, uh, I, I enjoy much those interruptions because it reminds of the dialogue by Plato precisely. Well, uh, well that's what I, I say. I, I enjoyed your interruption with the, you know, it, 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 and, it, and then we were going, I wish we could sort of continue with that and, uh, and kind of uh, discuss the philosophy. But when we get into trying to interpret the nitty gritty, we get into a lot of things where he's talking in terms of God's will and things that are related to the universal, but not necessarily, you know, I, I, he was so much ahead of his time. And I think we all agree on that, right? It's just that uh, so much of his ahead of his time, at least in Europe, but- uh, Well, I, I would but, say that, I would say that he was, uh, uh, he was, he was capable to express the Platonic uh, uh, heritage uh, okay. in order to to slow a little bit the uh, the okay I hate to use that word uh, well no I won't use the word I hate I would say in order to stop the advance of the establishment okay yeah. uh, and and, and, and let's, let's not forget, uh, he was in a society of monarchies, okay? So he had to navigate uh, because I, th I think that because of his deep understanding of Platonic uh, uh, discoveries, uh, he, wa he was a second Machiavelli, if you want, okay? Uh, you know very well that Machiavelli often is perceived as a uh, the guy helping the prince, but Machiavelli was the guy helping the people. Okay, oh, yeah. so no, for I me, agree Leibniz, with you about that. yes, yes, Leibniz is a second Machiavelli, but even more skillful because uh, Machiavelli was capable to begin the education for the common man, and I would say that Leibniz brought it to a higher level, and we are more or less the direct heir to those two, if you want. Yeah. No, really. or, or, or to take the ancestor in the West, Plato. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm just getting back to a lot of Plato myself. I mean, for me, it's a, it's a matter of rereading and looking at it in terms of this particular discussion because uh, it was something that I played. It was something I read years ago. And uh, now uh, a lot of it 
when you reread it, it makes more sense, you know. And, and well, play was interesting even years ago, but it's just now we can interpret him in a different way, and that this whole discussion has helped me do that. Uh, it's uh, and the whole thing where it's leading though, and uh, I think our side discussions kind of bring that out is the whole society of going back to our present society and uh, how human nature tends to distort things uh, over time. And, and uh, uh, he's talking about the goodness of the soul, which is kind of a, a universal quality. And we still come to that today where people are, uh, are divided by their uh, self-interest and, and their ideas that, that are more, uh, that are broader. I've just been reading, uh, I, you might have read uh, Confessions of a, uh, <laughs> Confessions of a, uh, what was it? Economic Hitman? Economic Hitman. So it's just such a great book. And that relates to this, you know, I mean, it, 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 the, the whole thing is about morality. And uh, here are the guys coming uh, from, uh, hey, Bob, Bob, from his Bob. gut and sticking yeah. his neck out and, and writing a book about all the horrible things that he's done and all, yeah. all yeah. the horrible things that are going on in the world. And, uh, you know, I can relate that to this, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely, and I even ha I even talked to someone recently that to that told to me to show to what extent that uh, that corruption has penetrated the soul of most people. Uh, he said to me, "I don't understand why China is building infrastructure. Why not uh, create a, a, a financial bubble and to live uh, uh, by exploiting yeah. people by using a financial bubble instead of building yeah. infrastructure?" I don't understand that. So, okay, to show to what extent the mind is completely yeah. out, uh, upside down. Yeah, uh, well, it was just uh, scary, but the, 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 this is the historical basis. I never really saw the connections until coming to this website, to uh, the Rising Tide, uh, where they start talking from the basis, uh, Cynthia's article on on uh, the city of London, my God, you know, that opened my eyes to it. It connected a lot of things. I had written, there's uh, a book by Nicholas Shaxton called Treasure Islands, which talks about the, the, the just the, the tax havens and all that before. But uh, her article really connected it and then when you go into the history and we're talking, we start talking about Venetians. I always thought that I, I, I was kind of a history major in school. So I always thought you know, the Venetians were really something of an intrigue at the time of the Crusades, even, even going back that far. And just so uh, fascinating in terms of how, how, did, they, how did they control uh, the merchant class at the time and, uh, and just kind of schemed against everything. Uh, so then, then when this site made the connection between the Venetians and, uh, and England, the invade just, I mean, through Holland and uh, other places and the Schiller article, which uh, I also listened to the, uh, I think it was Cynthia's lecture. Uh, it just brings it all together. And uh, I was very, very uh, uh, grateful for that, you know? And so 
I, there's a lot that, that uh, you know, a lot of dots to put together here. And uh, that's my purpose in coming to the site. I really, aside from the fact that I, I very much enjoy the, uh, the kind of intellectual discussions that you can't get in other places. Yeah, I, I enjoy absolutely your interruption because it's destroyed completely Matt's schedule. <laughs> I'm actually, it's I'm going to record, I'm going to record, yeah, Bob, Bob, what you're, what you just said there, I'm going to just splice this just out and make that like a promotional video for the Rising Tide Foundation. So you know. <laughs> well, it, well, I love it. I love it. <laughs> but, <laughs> You know, I, 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 I go off on a tangent every once in a while, I know that. But uh, the point is, uh, it is uh, outstanding in, in the historical basis. I know you guys, I learned, I didn't even know who, uh, what's his name, Lyndon LaRouche was. <coughs> I never heard of him. I confused Lyndon LaRouche with, with the Wayne LaPierre, the founder of the because we never knew, I mean, I'm in the States and probably in Canada, he was more of a, a, uh, a personality, I would think. But in, of course, uh, at that time, years going back, uh, even five years or what's up, uh, I was subjected to the, uh, to the media of the time. And Lyndon LaRouche, I don't think that I ever seen him reading in the New York Times or, or uh, even at that time, I was probably reading the, the Chronicle. And uh, I didn't uh, have, uh, you know, I just, I, I must have been the French name LaRouche or LaPierre. I thought of the, I thought of the, the, uh, what are the gun, the gun lobby. So, I mean, there, here it is. I consider myself an educated guy. And uh, at the same time, uh, it, it's easy to screw up with names. And uh, so I, have, I, 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 I agree with him a lot of things. I disagree on the, Nuclear, as you know, that's that that hasn't changed. Wait, 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 guys, guys. Um, do we want to try to squeeze out number thirty-one before before uh, we start? Okay, reading? all right. Okay, you guys, you guys can't talk about that. Okay. No, we, <laughs> no, we can't. It's just that you know that's that's a separate conversation. Oh, okay, I know. That's another conversation. That what I, I all right. Like it's, um, though, though Leibniz would endorse nuclear power. <laughs> I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> Um, okay, so who, who's at uh, 31? Oh, damn. You want me to keep going? Um, sure, I can how, about, uh, how about Eureka? I haven't heard of Eureka today. Sounds good. Ryan, we got to get you a new mic, man. <laughs> 31. Finally. God's graces are purely gifts, and creatures have no claim on them. We can't fully explain how God chooses to distribute them by appealing to his foreknowledge, whether absolute or conditional, of how men are going to act in the future. But we mustn't think of them as absolute or arbitrary decrees for which there are no rational grounds. As for God's foreknowledge of our faith or good works, it is quite true that God has chosen only those whose faith and charity he foresaw, foreseeing that he would endow them with faith. But the old question comes up again, why will God make a gift of faith for of good works to some people and not to others. A difficulty about this arises from the fact that grace is effective in a man only to the extent that he brings something of himself to it. Although to act well 
a man needs to be stimulated to the good and converted, he must also then do it by means of his own resources and men vary in what their inner resources are corresponding to how they vary in what grace is given them. So included in God's knowledge is not only his foresight of faith and of good deeds, but also his foresight of what a man himself will contribute towards them, his natural dispositions in that direction. It seems to many thinkers that we could say this, God sees what a man's natural dispositions will be, and thus what he would do without grace or extraordinary assistance, or at least what he will contribute from his own side in addition to anything that may be contributed by grace. So God could have decided to give grace to those whose natural dispositions were the best, or at any rate, were the least imperfect or sinful. But if that were so, those natural dispositions, to the extent that they are good, are also the effect of grace, ordinary grace this time, because in this respect to two, God has favored some people more than others. Now, since according to this doctrine, God knows perfectly well that the natural advantages he gives will be the ground for his grace or extraordinary help, doesn't everything in the end depend on his mercy? Well, we don't know how or how much God takes account of natural dispositions in his dispensing or grace. So I think that the most exact and the safest thing to say is what is dictated by my principles. And I have already said it once, namely, among possible beings, there must be the person of Peter or John, whose notion or idea contains this whole sequence of ordinary and extraordinary ordinary graces and all the rest of the these events with their circumstances and from amongst an infinity of other equally possible people it please god to choose that person for actual existence after this it seems that there is nothing more to ask and that all the difficulties disappear for as to this single great question, why it pleased God to choose this person from among all other possible persons, it would be very unreasonable not to be satisfied with the general reason I have given, the details being beyond this. So instead of having recourse to an absolute and arbitrary decree that is unreasonable because there are no reasons for it or two reasons that fail to resolve the difficulty because they need reasons in their turn. It would be the best to say in agreement with St. Paul that there are certain great reasons for God's choices, reasons of wisdom or of fitness that are unknown to mortals. God has conformed to these reasons, which are founded on the general order whose aim is the greatest perfection of the universe. The themes of this discourse, the glory of God and the manifestation of his justice, his mercy and his perfections generally, and finally, the immense profundity, pr profundity of riches that and enraptured the soul of St. Paul, all come down to that in the end.
continue? I guess we do one more and then uh, and then round it out for tonight. 32. I have to add only that the thoughts I have just seen, just been explaining, and in particular, the great principle of the perfect of God's operations and that of the notion of a substance containing all its events with all their circumstances, so far from harming religion, serve to reinforce it. They blow away some very serious difficulties, inspire souls with love of God, and elevate minds to the understanding of incorporeal substances, doing all this far better than did any previous theories. For it's quite clear that all other substances depend on God, as thoughts emanate from our substance, and in that way depend on it. That God is all in all and is intimately united to all created things in proportion to how perfect they are. That he alone by his influence determines them from outside. Elaborating this last point, if to act on something is to affect it immediately, that is directly, which is correct in the strict language of metaphysics, it can be said that in this sense, only God acts on me and can do me good or harm. Other substances cannot, strictly speaking, help or harm me because they contribute only to God's reason for making those changes. The other substances do come into those reasons because God takes account of all substances when he shares out his blessings and makes them adjust to one another. So it is the, so it is he alone who produces the connection or communication among substances. He brings it about that the state of one one side or agree with those of another. <coughs> Excuse me. And as a result that one substance can correctly perceive what state another is in. But we, we needn't always mention the universal cause in particular cases. And in common parlance, the items that we say act on a given substance, putting it into a certain state, are the ones that enter into God's reasons for putting it into that state in the sense that I explained above. We can also see that every substance has a perfect spontaneity that everything that happens to it is a consequence of its idea or of its nature and that nothing affects it from outside except God alone. In, in brackets and substance with intellect, this spontaneity becomes freedom. This is why a certain person of very lofty mind and revered holiness used to say that the soul should often think as though there were only God and it in the world. Nothing can make us understand immortality better than this independence and extent of the soul, which absolutely shelters it from everything external since it alone constitutes its whole world and together with God is sufficient for itself. It is possible for the soul to come to an end through absolute annihilation, but it's coming to an end in any other way, being destroyed by dissolution through damage like a machine is just as impossible as it is that the world should destroy itself unaided. 
changes in the extended mass will call our body could not have any effect on the soul, nor could the dissolution of that body destroy what is indecisive, indivisible, namely the soul, indivisible, namely the soul. I'm not sure. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on this. Why? Um, okay, well, I, I get the idea that the soul is something which is a simple non-composite substance as a monad, which is which has no windows or parts like a machine that he was, he's been describing. But when he describes, and he also said earlier that you know, he also believes in the immortality of the soul and, and you know, cites Plato's Mino and, and Phaedo for that. But then when he says here that it could end through absolute annihilation, that did confuse me how he's thinking. Does anybody have any hypotheses of what he is he's thinking about when he says such a thing? How could a soul end, come to an end through absolute annihilation? Yes, because annihilation here, you should not think as destruction, okay? And for destruction, he said dissolution, just the next line, okay? But you have to understand here that annihilation is absolute union with God. I was not, I was thinking about as a pure negation, as we commonly use that term. Um, I wasn't thinking about it that way. Oh, that changed a lot. <clears throat> But yeah, that's I, the only way. That's the only way for a soul to disappear. Because if you remember the three levels of Leibniz theory, that is not clearly manifest here, but he will distinguish between perceiving monads, rational monads, and super monad. Okay, mm -hmm. and super monad, of course, is a synonym, synonym of God. You already understand for sure. So the only way for the rational monad to be annihilated or to disappear is to fuse intimately in the super monad. And let's not forget that Plato has the same idea because at the end of chapter 7 when he was speaking of the allegory of the cave once again uh, uh, you can see the, the eternal form of goodness okay, and that's where you truly vibrate, participate with God, or to use St. Augustine words, agape, dancing together with grace. But when you go to the core of the Son of the Absolute, you cannot see it. You can only become it. Mm. It's an interesting idea. Very interesting idea. And I would, I would very much like to also get the original text, the original Latin uh, text that this was written in to see some of these, what choices the translator made in his words. But what you've just said does make sense and it does fit into the context of how he's developing his thought. Hmm. Interesting. And, and let's, let's not forget, okay? It's written, it is possible, okay? It doesn't mean that it's automatic that every rational monad when go to the end of the journey, it is only possible. Mm -hmm. Right. Any other thoughts or, or questions here? There's a lot of material in this. The, the, I'm going to reread re these last two sections because, I mean, they're, they're packed in with a lot of stuff. Um. Uh, maybe another thing that is very interesting, at the very beginning of 32, uh, maybe the 10 or 12 line, uh, that God is all in all and is intimately united to all created things in proportion to how perfect they are, that he alone by his influence determines them from outside. Okay, so for me, the key words is, and is intimately 
united to all create the things in proportion to how perfect are okay and uh, it's linked for me that to the, the the lines you want you wanted to discuss it is possible to be for song to be annihil annihilated in the sense that uh, to return to the dance agape and grace God can only influence the rational monad, the soul, only in proportion to how that soul is willing to enter into harmony of the super with the super monad. Uh, it's the core of freedom. You can cannot the uh, each individual rational monad to end in resonance in harmony with a super monad that's your free will mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and, and that that's a point within all of his even in his physics in his work in the specimen dynamicum and all of his work on the more like even practical physics he's always hammering at this idea of the sovereignty of every essence and that the, there's a certain nature of things which one essence, one monad, so to speak, can't be the cause of the changes that occur in another essence or monad. It's it's only through this higher super monad, or as as your terminology is is being used, Quan, uh, but God, that things change. But it's not. It's not like you can't say. Bill caused. Uh, his son to make a discovery. It's like the son made a discovery because there is self-contained monad. Uh, Bill might have done things wisely that awoke it, the passion or the curiosity, but you, but it would be wrong to say this person caused this other person to do a change or anything in nature in, in some ways. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's a, aren't, aren't they saying that the, the soul has to have a, a receptor for you know or otherwise like you know, if it's a broken moral compass it's not going to work uh, I, I, I maybe i'm misinterpreting that but, uh, uh, yeah I, the, the monad yeah. thing the, when we when we talk about a monad uh, could you could you define that for me again please well uh, you know what he hasn't even used the word monad well, right in this, in the discourses, he hasn't really yeah, the discourses, once right. or twice earlier on. But yes, right, Quan, go on. It's a, it's our soul, okay? It's our rational soul. It's our capability to be aware, and uh, that's the that's our rational monad, okay? That's the that's the seed, okay? We was we were talking about the the seed of awareness last time or two weeks uh, ago. Okay, so that's the seed. Okay, the monad, the rational monad, the seed of awareness, and precisely at the center of that seed of awareness is that in the freedom, free will, to elevate our frequency of vibration. And yeah, I feel a little a bit bad to, to say that, but it's our little bit new age. Mm -hmm. But wow, well, <laughs> well uh, to 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 to. to to, to modulate our capability to be in harmony with the super monad. And we have, we have a pathway to walk. And, uh, and uh, once again, uh, the, the, the one of the nexus, one of the major station is precisely the door between the first floor of beauty and the second floor of beauty. And those are kind of spaceship, if you want, for the rational monads to go to the super monad. But, but the rational monad has to desire it in order to go to the super monad. And as a- it, is, so it has to be motivated, Quan? It yes, has to yes. Be, has to be motivated or, and in terms of, in other words, like if, it, if, it, if, uh, yes. the, if the intelligence is all self-interest, then it's not going to be motivated uh, to receive anything that contradicts that self-interest. Exactly. Or, exactly. Um, exactly. Oh. Uh, if you're too, if you're too dirty, for example, you cannot be friends with people who are 
uh, speak in span clean, for example. Okay, that's I, I know it's a very laughable comparison, but uh, uh, you understand what I mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just to keep in mind as well, like, and and I guess the more we encounter Leibniz's writings and the term monad is developed more and more in time, um, it's not, though, though we're talking about one of the higher order uh, monads by dealing with uh, individual identities and understanding, like our understanding of things that it generates our identities as, as self-aware beings of accessing free will and spontaneity and change. Um, there are, there are orders of monads too, right? And in, you could even say like calcium or sodium, um, everything that has existence exists because of the essence of their being. There's a certain being that they're expressing and it wouldn't, you could, you could say, um, the carb, the, the, the bicarbonate when it acts a certain way and it, it wouldn't be that by combining it with sodium that you get sodium bicarbonate that the, that the, the car, the, the carbon atoms are all of a sudden changing because of the sodium. It's that they're changing the way that they're changing and that they have a relationship or a harmony with the sodium. So there's two different paradigms in science. One, one more materialist, non-Leibnizian approach would be like the, the material thing is causing the change. The Leibnizian approach would be no, the things are changing according to their own internal nature. That is, uh, that, that will just happen when you put another thing into proximity near it. So it'll still be sodium even though now there's carbon, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's so, but things are changing because they're sovereign and that they have a nature to them and how they will change with certain stimulation or won't change. Um, so it, again, it, it's, it seems subtle. Doesn't even maybe seem that important, but it, it does make a lot of difference in terms of how you generate hypotheses or explore the unknown when you apply that type of these two approaches to going from the state of ignorance in science into trying to figure out things and generating, creating new hypotheses that explain things, you'll, you'll access a different spectrum in one mode than you would in the other mode. One, one will handicap you. Um, and Leibniz goes and proves that by making real d discoveries that nobody else was able to make in terms of the infinitesimal calculus. And, and he even makes the point too in his writings that he, dis he went into mathematics, which he was never that good at, to make a discovery so that people would appreciate his metaphysics and moral philosophy better. He already had his metaphysics and moral philosophy before he, he spent his time discovering the laws of nature, but he did that because he had this intention to get people to take it more seriously. Ben Franklin had something similar with his uh, discoveries of electricity too. So that's just a, a very interesting side note that I, that caught my attention. But yeah, there's definite hierarchies of monads of existences. And nothing accepts it, affects any essence from the outside except God alone, is what he says here, literally. Because everything is, in its essence, an idea or nature. Matthew? I got to go to uh, supper, amigo. <laughs> oh, okay. Bon appétit. Yeah, but, but, yeah. Uh, but uh, are you going to continue uh, next week or what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to continue on. Yeah. Are, we're, you almost, are you almost through? Or, uh, well, yeah, look at where we're at. We're at uh, section 33 now. Of yeah. Okay, so you, you'll, you'll, you'll all be there next week. 